Well, good morning. Yeah, I get a turn once in a while. Well, I like the, the huddle thing. I think that's a, a good analogy. Did everyone get a handshake this morning as you come in to church? Did you get a handshake? Did, or did anybody not? Let me see your hand if you, if you did not receive a handshake. Oh, some of you didn't get a handshake. Okay. Um, why don't we do it now? Why don't you get up and just stretch and give a handshake? Say, welcome to church. Uh, bless you this morning. All right, well, thank you all for coming and for the visitors. May the Lord have a blessing upon you this morning. I've uh, chosen my title of my message this morning. We have a communion service, and I, I told Pastor Billy that, you know, I would kind of lead into it, so it'll be towards the end that I'm going to lead into the communion, but I've chosen to speak on the fear of the Lord. The title of my message is Unite My Heart to Fear the Lord. Unite My Heart to Fear the Lord. Those are words that come from Psalms 86, verse 11. The fear of the Lord the Bible tells us, is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. It's one of the first things, it's the ABCs of being a Christian. It's one of the things that are important that even a child can learn and understand, that they should learn and understand. It's not something that we need to go to college for. You cannot get this in college. You get this by spending time with God. Spending time in his word. Being obedient. And, uh, you know, the, the reason for bringing a message that I chose, you know, to study the fear of the Lord because it's, you know, I can look around, and, and sometimes you wonder, why, don't, why isn't there more fear of the Lord? Why don't people have more respect for God and the things of God? And, uh, but the thing is, I don't need to look very far. I only need to look at my own heart and think, why don't I have more fear of the Lord? And um, one thing that I, I'll tell you right, right off the bat, before we get into it, that I learned... The closer you are to God, the healthier your fear of the Lord is going to be. So when I look at myself and I wonder, why don't I have the fear of the Lord? It's because my walk isn't as it ought to be. That maybe I have, you know, gone a little distance. I don't spend enough time with him. I don't give much thought about him. When you see somebody driving down the road, they have a sticker, no fear. That simply means they don't know God at all. And they have no fear. Why should they? When you don't know the Lord, you know nothing about him, you're not going to fear him. The fear of the Lord is an awareness that you are in the presence of a holy, just, and almighty God that he will hold you accountable for your motives, thoughts, 
words, and actions. The fear of the Lord is to desire to, to live in harmony with the righteous standards and to honor him in all that we do. Amen? This doesn't come naturally. It's something we learn. It's something we learn. And it is something we choose. Psalms 86, verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear the Lord. Now that's a prayer. That is something that he desired. That's something that he wanted in his life. The fear of the Lord that I'm talking about this morning is a very healthy fear. It's a positive. It's a good thing. It's not something you want to be afraid of. It's not, you know, something that we should, you know, if I have the fear of the Lord, you know, I say, praise the Lord. That's a good spot to be in. When you don't have the fear of the Lord, it's a terrible place to be in. The fear of the Lord will teach us great things. Throughout the Bible, many promises are given to those who fear the Lord. Um, Proverbs 22, verse 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. By the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. It is wise to be governed by the fear of God, to have a healthy fear of God. Now, I want us to look at a couple examples in Scripture. You know, where can we learn? How, you know, if, if you feel kind of like me, like I would like to have more fear of the Lord, I would like to have a healthy fear of the Lord, how can I get it? One place we can get it is, is by looking at creation. Another one is in his word. And the third one is going back in history. And also you can go through the Old Testament. You can look at history and see what happened there. So in other words, examples. Spiritual examples. Scriptural examples. So consider God's creation. The psalmist in Psalms chapter 8, verse 4, 3 and 4 says, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Psalms 8, verse 3 and 4. King David here, what he, said, he said, You know, when I consider your handiwork, your fingers. Your fingers have created all this stuff. The Bible tells us he holds the water of the ocean in his hand. You, you get a picture of a God that is amazing. You know, our mind can hardly comprehend how awesome, how big this God is. And King David looks at that. And, you know, we've been at the ocean, and uh, I've seen these big ferries, these big boats, and, uh, wow, it's, you look off the side of that, and it's like looking down a tower. Like, it's, it's high. You're high off the water. This is a big boat. And you look at the waves, and, wow, this, this is scary stuff. You don't want to, you know, creation is amazing. As, and even these big, powerful boats, ferries, ships, Titanic, they said, this is so big, God cannot even sink it. A very small little boat compared to God. And God had to prove that, yes, this boat too can sink. But I think in creation, King David says, when I consider all these things, I look at myself. 
wow, Lord, and you even give thought to me? You think about us? After all these things in creation and you still have, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Another one um, is, uh, go to Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. We have the, the God, um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. And we have uh, Moses leading the children of Israel back to the promised land. And they are in the wilderness. And, the, and verse 18, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mount. <clears throat> the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before you, be before your faces, that ye sin not. You know, these people, they looked at creation. They saw this mountain smoking. They saw the lightning, the thunders. That's one thing I like about storms. I have respect for lightning storms as well. You know, years ago, I was, we were, there was a lightning storm, and I, wanted to go from the house to the shop and there was a patch of trees in between. I had, we were just building the shop so I was going to secure something I believe. I, so I, I ran through the storm to the shop and the minute I stepped into the shop I heard a bang behind me, a, a lightning uh, hit a tree and right where I had run through a tree was snapped in half and it came down and it, it was so close that you know what, I laid it flat on my, I lay down. I was afraid. You know, it, it was a little too close for comfort. You know, when the lightning storm comes and all these things, it shows the power of God. God is very mighty. So we can look at creation. We, we can look at these things. And I don't think we all need to have these experiences that the Israelites had. The Apostle Paul says... Um, in Romans, the invisible things of him from creation are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in God had, so that they are without excuse. Basically, he's telling us there is enough evidence in creation, if you look around, that there is a God that governs all things. And he's not a small God. He is a mighty God. The next thing we want to look at is God's word. Like I said, we can learn respect from God's word. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31 Verse 12 and 13. Here's some instruction given to how to live to the children of Israel. And he says in verse 12, Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear that they may learn the fear of the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord their God as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. So here they are given instructions. Teach your children 
fathers and mothers, the people, your hired servants, the people that are around your house, your neighbors. When you sit down and you have coffee break and when you have lunch together, talk about the Lord. Talk about this great God we serve. Family devotions, extended family devotions. You know, there's a lot of camping going on nowadays. Wonderful time to do devotions. Plan a devotional. Do a devotional. Talk about God. Talk about God's laws. Talk about God's grace. I ask, I, I ask like many people this question. Is grace conditional? And most people, they give it some thought and they, 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 want, they want to say no and eventually they say, no, I don't think it is conditional. They say, the Bible tells us he resisteth the proud, gives grace to the humble. That's a condition. He resisteth the proud, gives grace to the humble. Mercy. There's a law of mercy. You read in the Psalms, King David, there's many Psalms that focus on mercy. It's when you've done wrong and you understand who God is and you know you have something coming, you beg for mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. There's a condition to mercy. Truth. Talk about what is truth. Many people don't know what the truth is. Talk about judgment. Judgment day. You know, have an understanding of all these things. I think we need an understanding of all these things. And when we get an understanding of all these things, it helps us to understand God more. God's holiness. We serve a holy God. What does that mean? Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, I'm not going to read it this morning, but there, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, the Lord is basically instructing the Israelites. He's saying, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. I brought you through this promised land. Now I want you to have a king who governs by this book. He says the king is required to have a copy of this. He is required to study it daily and to govern my people according to this book. That's what requ is required if you're going to rule God's people. The kings of Israel, they were supposed, that was a requirement. You know, we have, we have come a long way from that. You know, our governments don't govern by that book. As a matter of fact, they govern against that book. I don't know if you've ever gone to court. I've, I've been in court, and I, I've seen the law book. It's a lot thicker than this. They could, ha they could use this book and to be well covered. Their law book is a lot bigger. They have a law for all these little things, and they keep making more laws, more laws, more laws, all the time because it's not working yet. And the third thing we want to look at is examples. Scriptural examples. We can learn. You know how it works in the home, right? Older children get the training. The younger ones, they see just, oh, I, I know what older brother got. I'm not going to go there. And we, we, we can do the same thing in Scripture. We can look at what, oh, what did they do wrong. I'm not going there. I know what God did to Belshazzar. King of Babylon. Babylon was a beautiful, big, fortified city. From here to Canyon Creek, 50 miles that way, 50 miles that way, 50 miles. That's how big the city was. Nebuchadnezzar, um, Babylon. The wall was 300 feet high. There was a river flowing through the city. It came underneath the wall and went throughout, went out the other side. They had most beautiful gardens in there. The children of Israel, they said, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, we wept and we cried. Because they were taken captive there. Daniel was one of them. They had it made. 
Belshazzar, who was, who was king at the time, threw a party. They had all the golden vessels from Jerusalem. They had stolen them, taken all the captive. They had the vessels, the golden vessels. They, Belshazzar said, let's have a party. Let's bring out the golden vessels, let's drink wine, and let's, let's enjoy life. While in the middle of their enjoying life, all of a sudden, there was a hand on the wall. He saw a hand, just a hand, and it was writing. Your days are numbered. You have been weighed in the balance, You've been, you come short. It says his uh, joints became so loose that his knees clapped together. I've never been that nervous. But he was extremely nervous. His life, he, he had been, he had come short. King David also said, King David experienced a number of things. And King David says in Psalms 88, verse 16, he says, The fierce wrath, thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. In other words, he was, he said, I've messed up big time. What do I do now? I'm, I'm terribly afraid. Lord, you are almighty God. But being King David that he was, he, he cried out to God, help me. He pleaded for mercy. He had the fear of the Lord. Now the Apostle Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Prophet Isaiah says, when he saw the throne, when he saw the vision, he said, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man with unclean lips, living among people with unclean lips. You know, it doesn't look good for me standing in a, before a holy God. What do we do? Well, we cry out to God. And Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, not sure why he's called the wisest man. He tried all the most foolish things ever was. But he tried it all. And in the end, he said, now this, this is the conclusion of the whole matter, he said. Fear God. And keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. If you want to live, this is how you live. Not the way I did. You know, he's acknowledging that he messed up big time. But in the end, he gave us this wisdom. So we can learn. We can learn from creation. We can learn... From his word, we can learn from examples. Now, how do I, in my relationship to God, day to day, how do I live it out? The broad command to fear the Lord involves understanding several things about a believer's relationship with God. So we'll look at a couple here. We understand that God is loving, merciful, and forgiving. God is also holy, righteous, and just. Knowing God and understanding his character means accepting the fact that his justice and holiness will cause him to judge sin. Amen? You know, we, we can't just pick the one side of God. God is holy, 
For God is loving, merciful, and forgiving. Yes, he is. It's all true. God is also holy. God is righteous. God is just. Therefore, he has to do something with sin. You know, the first man, the first woman, Adam and Eve, when they, when they sinned, they knew right away. They ran to hide from an all-knowing God. Well, God pretended he didn't know where they were, and they said, hey, where are you, Adam? Oh, I'm hiding. <laughs> I see you. No. God knows all our stuff. It's not that he doesn't know. If we think we're hiding it, you know, maybe we we're hiding stuff from other people, but we, we can't hide stuff from God. But God is gracious. He says, why don't you come forth? And why don't you tell me? That's what Adam and Eve did. They came forth. And God helped them in their shortcomings. Moses, I'm not going to read that scripture. We've been in Deuteronomy a few times this morning. But the, with the Israelites, they were sinning. And Moses was afraid. He went to God and he says, I'm afraid what's going to happen. And you know what? I, I think we look around today and we, we look at the lack of the fear of the Lord. And you know, we should be afraid of what's going to happen. Judgment Day is coming. The end is coming. We know it. No different than Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar. You know, the writing was on the wall. We have the book. It says he's coming back soon. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 says, It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That is, if you are on the wrong side of his justice. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That is, if you're caught in the balance like Belshazzar wanting, you've come short. And you haven't cried out to God for mercy. You haven't changed your ways. You know, the fear of the Lord can produce, I would say can, it doesn't always. The fear of the Lord can produce faith. Let me give you an example. When the children of Israelites left Egypt, God released them. God did many miracles, and they, Moses led them out of Egypt. And they were on their way to the promised land. They were going, and there was two mountains. There, there was a narrow pathway. They come between the mountains. They come, and there's an ocean. And they looked, and how can we cross this ocean? We don't have boats. They were, so they were camping there. Well, the Egyptians, they heard what had happened, that the, the Israelites are trapped. Let's go get them. So they come up behind them. There was no way out. There's a mountain there, the mountain here, and the ocean there, and the Israelite ar Egyptian army come up behind them. And they cried out to God. And we all know what happened. God opened up the ocean. He opened up the ocean. They walked through on dry ground. They came out the other side as soon as the last person was up. The Egyptian army, they were by that time in the middle of the ocean. And God closed up the ocean. Now, it's, now this is what it says. They feared the Lord, and put their trust in him. Amen? 
Imagine this scene. Imagine you had been there. God's grace has brought you through. You're standing on safe, dry ground. You just walked through the ocean. Now you see your enemy drowned. You would have respect for God. You would say, thank you, Lord. You're an amazing God. You led us through safely. And look what happened to these. They feared the Lord and put their trust in him. You know, fearing the Lord produces confidence. The Lord is on my side. Amen? They, the Israelites could have said that, and they said it many times. King David, would, you, when, you, when you read the Psalms, you can see he's, he's with me. He's on my side. Fearing the Lord produces confidence. It gives us hope and trust in him, which are all necessary if we are looking to God for mercy, for forgiveness and salvation. Fearing the Lord produces confidence, hope, and trust in him, which are necessary when we are looking for God to God for mercy, forgiveness, and salvation. And the last one, this one will lead us into communion. Deuteronomy chapter 14, if you want to turn to it. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 and 23. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thy oil, of thy firstlings, of thy herds, of the flocks, because that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. So he's telling us here that we are to tithe. You know, when we, when we are smaller, we cry out to God, Lord, bless this, help us with this. And then God gives us increase. And you know, the Bible does tell us that, you know what, when you are increased, don't forget God. He had to warn the Israelites, don't forget me when you're doing well in the good years. Remember me, it's I who helped you. Now he's telling, the law here says, you know what, give a tithe of everything, of all your increase. Come and give it to the house of God. Give it to the Lord so that you will continue to fear, have fear for me. A healthy fear. It is to show respect to the one who blesses. We read in the book of Malachi chapter 3 verse 8. You know, he gives a question. Will a man rob God, and yet you have robbed me, he says. You know, it's it just a thought. Would a man rob God? He says, yes, yes, people rob me. You know, the Israelites, they had robbed God. People had, you can read that whole thing, and it, it's, the, it's the churches, they weren't doing so well, but the people were doing well. They were living in houses, big houses. But the house of the Lord was, wasn't much there, just a tent. And God said it's not right. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9.
Here's a principle. You know, we're not under the law, and I'm not going to pretend we are. You know, I, I can't teach the law of tithing in, in, in a sense, but I'm going to say this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man, according as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now that's, that's just a simple law. And I'll turn all the way back to the beginning, Genesis chapter 14. Now here's a very interesting chapter which I could give you a homework on would take you quite a while. It's, a, it's quite a challenge to, to pick this chapter apart and to, what, and to see what's happening here. But basically, this, this involves the whole area of Sodom, Gomorrah, uh, Abraham, Lot, uh, Salem, which um, later became Jerusalem, um, and uh, the context here is we all know that Abraham and Lot, they grew, they became larger, and there wasn't enough room for them, so Abraham said, Lot, which side do you choose? Where are you going to live? Well, Lot chose the city and the, the, the rivers, the, the nice land, and Abraham went the other way. Well, before long, um, we, we know the story of Lot and all that happened. Well, there was an army that came, and that's what chapter 14 is about. The army came, and they captured some of the cities, including a lot was taken. A lot of possessions were taken, and the army took him away. News came to Abraham, and Abraham decides, you know what? Should we pursue them? And God allowed, said, yeah, you, you go after them. So Abraham goes and pursues, and he takes, brings Lot back, and all the children, and everything that was taken captive, all the material things were taken captive, and so they come back. When Abraham comes back with the spoil, and with everything that, that was taken back, there's certain people that meet him, and that's the thing I want you to see. In verse, we'll start in verse 17. Or verse 16, and he brought back all the goods and all, also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chaldeeroam and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shevin, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemy, enemies into thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Now our time is basically up this morning, but here, here's the thing. Abraham was a man of God. Abraham was a man who feared the Lord, and his life showed it. When he came back, the king of Sodom met him, and he said, good, you know, basically, can I have my stuff back that was stolen from me? But here's the thing. 
Melchizedek, king of Salem, was also there to greet him. He was there to greet him, to congratulate him, and to bless him. It wasn't the king of Sodom who brought wine and oil, or wine and bread. It was Melchizedek, who hadn't lost a thing. Who was the pro, who was who served the Most High God? He came and refreshed all the people that had been taken captive. He gave them wine and bread for refreshment. He blessed Abraham. Abraham, after just doing the war, came back and he also said, I give you my tithe. I give you a tithe of everything that I possess. There was no law that he should do it. This was well before the law came out. This was his heart. He had learned to fear the Lord. His heart was united with God. He said, I'll give you, Lord, because I know you are a mighty God. And I believe this day when this war was done, which was a very small war, Abraham only had a few men. It's not that he had an army like King David. He had a few you know, farmers helping him farm. But there were some men, it says that they were trained in this. But God blessed it. And after it was done, Melchizedek came with wine and bread. What's interesting about this Melchizedek is, if you study him, it says in the New Testament that he had no father, no mother. In the Hebrews, you read about this Melchizedek. You know, I, I, I need to study it more yet, but it's like Jesus Christ is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, after this example. You know, Jesus Christ... He didn't become a priest after Aaron. Aaron, who was the priest for Israel. Jesus Christ did not become a priest after them because they weren't good enough. But he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So this morning, as we do communion, you know, my prayer is that as you predict of it, it'll be a refreshment to you. You know, as as we huddle, and as we go back out, that you would be strengthened. That you, you would have a healthy respect, the fear of the Lord, and this would show in everything we do, everything we say. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this morning. I thank you for your word that is so, so amazing. Lord, I thank you for some of the mysteries that are hard to comprehend. Be Lord, we know we, you, you are almighty, all-wise, all-knowing. You are a holy God, a just. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful, for giving us grace, undeserved favor. As Paul says, Lord, help us not to take it for granted. But Lord, when grace was bestowed upon me, it was not bestowed in vain. Lord, I pray that this morning again we would receive strength. And Lord, that our life would show that we do fear you, we have respect. We love you, and we want the world to know, Lord, that there is a God, that there is a day coming where everything will be weighed in a balance. And we want it to be a good day, Lord, where we will rejoice to be with you for all eternity. I pray that you would give each one here this morning confidence and trust as the Israelites 
gained confidence as they saw your miracles. We serve the same God, and I thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.